All right, so we continue to look at this text by Shelley, Defense of Poetry, and we also briefly saw in the first uh, class where how he is not really a defense of poetry in general, but it's a defense of uh, a lot of things which contribute to the production of uh, different kinds of art forms. We realize that this is not a very text centric kind of uh, discussion that he initiates from the beginning. He is not particularly talking about individual texts in order to defend or support certain kinds of writing and in the course of time, especially in the second half, I feel this is a proper rendition of the romantic spirit that Shelley entirely embodied. And if you read up about Shelley's life, he has been referred to as the uh, Matt Shelley. Yeah? He had these uh, very, very exciting phases in life where he also was thrown out of college uh, for writing an, uh, a, a piece which was seen as blasphemous. Yeah? He had an atheistic uh, uh, piece of writing which was not well received at all. So, he was someone who really lived life in the radical terms that um, Wordsworth perhaps you know very ideally had articulated in his lyrical ballads. So, he continues to be in uh, say in, in praise of the contemporary ways in which things are changing not just in terms of the literary spirit, but in terms of the uh, in terms of culture in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, politics. But at the same time there is also a very uh, curious way in which this is something that we do not find in all other romantic writers. There is a curious way in which he manages to bring in say the classical tradition as well as the contemporary tradition when he refers to the uh, writings, when he refers to the spirit that they embodied in general. So, we have moved on to the, we have skipped a few things in the first half, we have moved on to the second half of the essay where he first draws attention to the this event, the abolition of personal slavery. So, there is a uh, section we he, where he ends with saying the abolition of personal and domestic slavery and the emancipation of women from a great part of the degrading restraints of antiquity were among the consequences of these events. He is referring to a lot of uh, uh, contemporary uh, social, cultural and religious events and political events which had led to tremendous changes across Europe. We, we had already noted while discussing before we started discussing lyrical ballads that 18th century was this year of this uh, century of revolutions across Europe. So, in many ways England was perhaps the only nation which contained the outbreak of this uh, revolt in any visible forms, but entire Europe was literally boiling and all these major revolutions were happening throughout the 18th century and they you know, throughout the 18th century and they continue to become really big in the 19th century as we know. So, he is paying very direct tribute to these series of events which he uh, collapses them entirely into this statement of the abolition of personal and domestic slavery. He is not really uh, referring to the abolition of slavery in America alone. He is referring to a range of things which were contained, which were uh, which, which uh, history had managed to perhaps annihilate forever in terms of uh, different forms of slavery in domestic, in political, in religious, in cultural ways. And he goes on to tell us the abolition of personal slavery, uh, personal slavery is the basis of the highest political hope that it can enter into the mind of man to conceive. So, he talks about a range of things which becomes possible after this abolition of uh, slavery. He looks at it in a broad political sense and look at these following statements. The freedom of women produced the poetry of sexual love. Love became a religion. The idols of whose worship were ever present. It was as if the statues of Apollo and the Muses had been endowed with life and motion and had walked forth among their worshippers. So, earth became peopled with the inhabitants of a diviner world. So, he is essentially and by and large romanticizing this, but we cannot miss that large point that he is making how political freedom essentially is not about having a democracy or having a better ruler. It is also about these micro kinds of emancipations which will have a larger reflection in uh, literature like you know uh, freedom of women producing the poetry of sexual love or love becoming a religion and uh, these divine beings occupying the uh, fictional worlds, these poetical worlds in ways which they could never imagine before. So, uh, he keeps giving these examples. This is again one of the things, uh, one of the unique things that Shelley does in comparison to his other uh, contemporaries. He, his work is littered with a lot of classical references, which also tells us about his scholarship, but it also requires some additional reading for us to make sense of some of the examples that he is giving us. So, in that sense, there is a connection that we can 
and later I think it will become more clear to you when we draw this connection between romanticism and um, modernism. Both are very esoteric in certain ways. There are no universal general examples that he uh, he, he burdens himself with there he does not there's no anxiety to give any universal general examples but on the other hand he gives examples which make private sense to him it's very esoteric in that sense but it also opens out to the world in terms of trying to draw these extensive parallels across uh, po politics religion and tying up everything towards what he himself is doing about these functions of poetry and in this case uh, uh, trying to do some criticism as well. Yeah? So, he talks extensively about uh, uh, Dante. At successive intervals, Ariosto, Tasso, Shakespeare, Spencer, uh, Cauldron, Rousseau and the great writers of our own age have celebrated the dominion of love, planting as it were trophies in the human mind of that sublimest victory over sensuality and force. Look at these combinations over here. Yeah? Shakespeare, Sen Spencer, Rousseau, they are all together over here. Yeah? So, there is a transnational quality about it and this combination is very curious. Rousseau is a political writer as you know and Shakespeare and Spencer they belong to particular literary traditions. Yeah, There is no way in which traditionally both can be combined but in the romantic spectrum within this movement the way they look at politics, the way they look at literature, the way they look at religion they are all intertwined with one. Uh, that is perhaps one of the greatest radical uh, thoughts of that period where you cannot differentiate one from the other. Yeah? The radicalism in language is an extension of the radicalism that you see in politics. The radicalism in certain kinds of contents, if there is sexual love uh, manifested in women's writings, that is also an extension of the abolition of personal slavery. So, these threads which were always always together, they are being made visible in this uh, discourse and uh, the political writings which were seen as you know a different discourse altogether if you remember this dichotomy between uh, the kind of prose writings which could instruct and the kind of writings largely poetical which could delight yeah those were seen as two different strands and poetry always had to be something which would instruct through pleasing yeah so here we find these uh, barriers being broken down entirely when he brings together these otherwise um, odd set of uh, discourses uh, uh, together. Uh, this piece of writing, it ends with this oft quoted statement that poets are the unlegislated, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Yeah? So, here in, in various points in this piece of writing, he brings together these uh, otherwise disparate discourses together like he says over here, we owe this great benefit to the worship of which chivalry was the law and poets the prophets. It was always uh, uh, you know the poet being seen as this uh, uh, diviner, the poet being seen as a prophet, the seer that was always the uh, classical kind of rhetoric. But he also brings in certain modern institutions, certain modern tools to talk about poetry like law for instance. Law is a very modern invention as we know. It is part of enlightenment, it is part of the identification of the person, the, the, the human as an individual, it is about rights. Yeah? So, these different discourses are being brought together quite seamlessly without even bothering to give a preface about these things. Yeah? And um, look at the way in which he tries to situate Dante over here. Dante is not removed in this discourse from what is modern. The poetry of Dante may be considered as a bridge thrown over the stream of time which unites the modern and ancient world. The distorted notions of invisible things which Dante and his rival Milton have idealized are merely the mask and mantle in which these great poets walk through eternity enveloped and disguised. So, um, we, we may agree or uh, disagree with some of the notions and some of the opinions that he has in terms of the, his uh, uh, um, observations about Dante, about Milton which is uh, which we can find here and there in this entire text. But what I find most interesting is unlike the other two texts that we have uh, examined already, uh, Lyrical Ballads which is seen as this iconic inaugural text in terms of uh, inaugurating the romantic critical uh, movement and um, uh, Coleridge's Biographia Literaria which is again about the kind of poems and the kind of contents which were uh, brought together and that was examining it from a philosophical point of view. I think this text 
addresses gets to the heart of the question in multiple ways the only disadvantage as you may have already um, felt it you know it's, it's it's a very long drawn and if it were broken down into different pieces perhaps you know it would have been become more palatable in an in, a, in, a, in, a, in an academic classroom sense as well yeah so but he actually gets to the heart of the question in many ways does not digress into say minor issues such as the language used or the philosophy which was behind certain kinds of uh, political objectives political objects yeah so it it it, it uh, directly talks about the connection which originally perhaps uh, even uh, uh, what's what had in mind but never wanted to articulate it for various reasons the connection between contemporary politics and how that revolution also got infused into the um, the made the many cultural manifestations including poetry and here there is no way in which Shelley distinguishes between what was written earlier and what is written now. If there is something which could bridge the gap of time, then he is willing to use it. Chronology becomes only incidental as we can see over here. And, and the emphasis is more on continuity rather than entirely breaking away from the tradition and inaugurating something else altogether. That is how by looking at things through such a scheme of things, that is how he is able to look at uh, Dante as something that the poetry of Dante as something which unites, which has the power to unite the modern and the ancient world. The dichotomies we see are beginning to break down in, in various different ways. And this also, you know, we will soon come to that. There is a way in which we find that in spite of this um, radical uh, revolutionary strain that he continues to exhibit in this work, there is also a framework of morality within which he continues to work and it, uh, he rationalized that as well. We will discuss that as and when we come to it. And this engagement with uh, past works, he talks about Milton in very commendable ways. Nothing can, can exceed the energy and magnificence of the character of Satan as expressed in uh, Paradise Lost. It is a mistake to suppose that he could ever, he could ever have been intended for the popular personification of evil, implacable hate, patient cunning and a sleepless refinement of despise uh, to inflict the extremist anguish of an on an enemy. These things are evil and though venial in a slave are not to be forgiven in a tyrant, although redeemed by much that ennobles his defeat and one subdued are marked by all that dishonors his conquest in the victor. Milton's devil as a moral being is far superior to his god as one who preserves one who perseveres in some purpose which he has conceived to be excellent in spite of adversity and torture is to one who in the cold security of undoubted triumph inflicts the most horrible revenge upon his enemy he goes on yeah so this is uh, it's a very problematic statement as you can see milton's devil as a moral being is as far superior to his god yeah it is ironical in a certain way it is blasphemous but at the same time it is doing the right thing in terms of the literariness of it. Yeah? So, he is also the romantic critical movement is also trying to tell us that it is proper to do, it is possible to do an appropriate kind of criticism even if you are not in tandem with you know the belief systems of the time because this this is a statement which could have you know which could have earned perhaps uh, a, a, a burned at stake uh, status for uh, Shelley had he written this slum 200 years back yeah so there is a possibility to articulate this and also say even if we don't have to go f that far back even Johnson when he was writing he was very careful about and judging the moral world that Shakespeare had created. Johnson's preface talks about it, yeah, how it was not entirely edifying. Some of those things uh, uh, were not entirely edifying. And when um, Dryden, when Dryden was uh, uh, writing a preface to a translation of Chaucer, he did not want to include the uh, wife of Bath's tale and the knight's tale because of the bodiness, because of the licentiousness that those texts had. So, they were always conscious of these overlaps and they wanted to stay clear of it. So, what uh, the romantic movement in general and here precisely Shelley's works, it also encourages us to trespass these boundaries, but that also that in that process the uh, the the literariness, the critical quality gets further strengthened. Yeah, the the the, the critical 
uh, the faculties also get strengthened over here. It is not, nothing is being compromised in the name of religion or in the name of uh, uh, propriety as it were in the previous uh, uh, time. Milton has so far violated the pro popular creed as to have alleged no superiority of moral virtue to his God over his devil. Yeah? This is certainly you know, something we do not know whether Milton himself would have owned up to it. Of course, the text is uh, uh, the, 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 the text apparently is lost. Yeah, there is many have talked about this uh, since uh, this time. Uh, but though we do not know whether Milton himself would have owned up this claim entirely, this sort of a criticism becomes more possible. I think that is uh, something which the English critical stream did not have any claim on until that point of time. They were trying to, you know, there was, uh, they were trying to get out of the shackles of religion, but they also wanted to stay safe in terms of not really uh, overstepping their boundaries in any way. So, this is a properly radically radical revolutionary moment in terms of literature as well as criticism when you look at the range of works, the range of manifestations which came out since lyrical ballads. So, I, I hope this is also the thread is also beginning to the make more sense to you when you look at the trajectory from lyrical ballads onwards where different kinds of uh, revolutionary zeal are being exhibited by different poets. We may not find everything together in one single poet, but the uh, revolution in language was as much important as perhaps you know a revolution in this sort of articulation becomes important. Yeah, there is a lot of discussion that he has about Homer and Dante. Homer was the first and Dante the second epic poet and that is another confident way of uh, being able to talk, uh, being able to bring together say a classical artist, a classical writer as well as a contemporary writer in the same frame. There is no anxiety over here. This is not like you know uh, they do in the neoclassical time where they had to say yeah see uh, maybe Shakespeare has violated a few things but he is definitely the best yeah maybe Shakespeare did not have this but given that he was working with a different time and with a different set of raw material altogether, he is definitely the best. There is no anxiety over here to continue to prove that the English literary tradition is the best compared to the classical times. There is a seamless way in which he is able to engage with Milton as well as Dante in the same frame. Yeah? So, I uh, just want to bring this point also to you. When Dryden was translating uh, Chaucer, yeah, he has this compared, there is a preface where he compares uh, Ovid's works uh, uh, with Chaucer's works yeah? and he begins with a note of comparison and then he ends up elevating Chaucer over Ovid for all the right reasons and um, he also says that Chaucer was working at a time when language was still in its infancy. But Ovid was writing at a time when the Roman tongue had already reached its perfection. Yeah? So, with Ovid, after Ovid we do not find any stellar work coming out in the uh, in, in, in Roman literature. But with Chaucer, there is an inauguration that happened. There is a, uh, there is a way in which he is identified as a starting point and from that state of infancy, English literary, critical, uh, English literary tradition has produced much. So, this anxiety was always there within the neoclassical framework of understanding uh, literature in a chronological sense and looking at literatures from different parts of the world. They always wanted to present the English writers as the best in comparison to the classical writers or in comparison uh, to the other European writers. We do not find that anxiety at work in any of these uh, uh, romantic writers. Yeah? They have the confidence and that is also a confidence that they have received through tradition because there is no need for them to get defensive over particular kinds of traditions or get anxious about being overshadowed by another tradition or by another language. Yeah, that is also there, but we do find that within the critical framework there is a space to discuss things transnationally and looking at the larger thematic things based on. Uh, say the, the political, cultural or rather the religious frameworks. We will skip some of those discussions on Dante and Homer that also tells us about the view that uh, uh, Shelley had towards uh, poetry in general. And now just the way he could bring together different discourses and different narratives, he is also able to bring together different artistic expressions. The age immediately succeeding to that of Dante, Petrarch and Boccaccio was characterized by a revival in painting, sculpture and architecture. Chaucer caught the sacred inspiration and the superstructure of English literature is based upon the materials of Italian invention. Yeah? So, look at the trajectory that he is drawing. 
there's, it's almost like you know redrawing literary history outside the boundaries of uh, uh, the, the, the geographical limitations. Yeah, look at the see there is Chaucer becomes a descendant of Dante, Petrarch and Boccaccio over here and it is also in, in terms of genres yeah there is in between there is painting, sculpture and architecture and Chaucer catches on from that inspiration. Yeah? So, there is no anxiety here in locating Chaucer as the descendant of these variety of impulses which are not essentially English quote unquote English. Yeah? So, and this movement becomes this uh, uh, say this this uh, rhetoric this discourse itself becomes possible only because, because of these multiple revolutionary things that are happening during the time which Shelley is living. And if you go, if you know uh, about uh, you know the, the way in which the romantic poets worked they also engaged with these different disciplines at the same time you know the ode to a Grecian urn yeah it shows an evident interest in archaeology yeah and painting was something that endlessly fascinated them yeah. So, uh, it this, this fusion becomes possible entirely during that time and if you you, you maybe by far have taken a look at you know um, most of the representative original works which were iconic in terms of defining English uh, uh, criticism yeah we have not found this sort of an amalgamation this sort of an uh, you know ease of transaction across uh, national boundaries and across discourses until this point of time yeah and he is also aware of what he is doing let us not be betrayed from a defense into a critical history of poetry and its influence on society yeah. So, that is what he began with the original point that he began with was defense of poetry now he is saying let us not move into a critical history of poetry and its influence on society. So, the sections uh, proceeding to this uh, passage that was actually a uh, deliberate way in which he was also trying to give us a critical history of poetry and its influence on society be it enough to have pointed out the effects of poets in the large and true sense of the word upon their own and all succeeding times. But poets have been challenged to resign the civic ground to reasoners and mechanics on another plea. Yeah? So, this is this ongoing debate that he also uh, tries to engage with, but not in very central terms about the, uh, the this debate between uh, reason and imagination. Yeah, And of course, during the romantic uh, time, they do very boldly place imagination over everything else. Everything else takes a second seat and they are not apologetic in announcing that the end result, the, the, the end towards which poetry is working that is a pleasure nothing other than that. But this is also you know very interesting to notice that while the romantic poets are very bold and unapologetic in stating that we are pursuing pleasure and our aim is to deliver pleasure to the readers they also seem to be the most committed in terms of their response to the society yeah compared to the others who always wanted to maintain a distance from the court from the politics of those times or perhaps you know uh, do things in which would obviously give them some favor in terms of their relation with the court with the uh, political centers we do not find the romantic poets doing that at all they are not under the patronage of anyone which works very well to their advantage they are writing in a more modernized kind of system of uh, literary circuit yeah but uh, but also we notice that their affiliations are not dependent on anything dictated by the church or by the state yeah they are the ones who are able to directly say we are pursuing yeah, pleasure that we are not here to teach or to persuade and that itself I hope you are able to see the inherent irony over here the moment the artist gets uh, the uh, the moment the artists get the courage to state that this is entirely about pleasure we are not worried about teaching the right or the wrong thing they that that is also the moment which gives the most political agency to the artist yeah and we realize that it is again during these times that they are able to see the connection between these different discourses at work and also are further emboldened to articulate those things. There could be other factors also aiding this process, but the fact that we are seeing this being articulated very directly within the space of literary criticism, it tells us uh, uh, volumes about the kind of uh, uh, momentum the movement had begun to gain as well. So, a lot of these discussions about you know political economy, about labor, because he is also being 
very directly influenced by the different political movements happening in uh, the rest of Europe. I wanted to highlight this as well when he's talking about imagination and reason. It is admitted that the exercise of the imagination is most delightful, but it is alleged that that of reason is more useful. Yeah, so I wanted to keep this in mind. From now on, this is the argument that he is trying to pursue in a very, very rational, in a very clinically detached scientific way about imagination and reason. Yeah, he is giving a, he is trying to break down, unpack these uh, elements, try to give us some examples from the life of the literary artists and tell us, you know, how to put these things in different contexts. Yeah, so he tells us uh, about of course, you know, they all believe in pleasure. He further highlights it. It is difficult to define pleasure in its highest sense, the definition involving a number of apparent paradoxes. So, in between he also, you know, in, in this uh, uh, same piece of writing, he talks about two kinds of pleasure. One which is like very immediate, very superficial, the other one which is lasting. Yeah. So, this is again one differentiation that the romantic uh, movement and the romantic critics begin to elucidate that pleasure is not just one kind entirely, it could be of different kinds and they themselves, they, they of course, you know, they believe that they are giving out pleasure of the highest order. Good literature is giving out pleasure of the highest order which is not uh, temporary, which is not immediate, which has a lasting effect that also ties up with some of the things that even Aristotle spoke about in terms of, you know, tragedy becoming more, tragedy having a lasting impact compared to all the other forms because it has a cathartic effect which is also by in essence by extension we can say that you know here also he talks about the change which comes about in individuals and societies we will soon come to that. Our sympathy in tragic fiction depends on this principle. Tragedy delights by affording a shadow of the pleasure which exists in pain. I think this reorients our understanding of pleasure as well. Pleasure is not something which is the opposite of pain but it is a different sort of an experience altogether. Sometimes if tragedy can give us viewing a tragedy, experiencing a tragedy, if can if that can lead to a cathartic pleasure, yeah, we realize that pleasure is not something which can be entirely dismissed. It is not a superficial thing. It is not something which is uh, uh, which, which does not have a lasting impact at all. There is an attempt, a conscious attempt being made over here to elevate pleasure and to show that that is not an inferior thing at all. When you are talking about uh, reason being useful and imagination being uh, you know something uh, trivial compared to that and the, if the end of imagination is pleasure, yeah, you need not make this uh, uh, commonsensical argument that the end of uh, imagination is also something very trivial. Pleasure is not something very trivial, it is very, very deep. Yeah, He does not directly get into the philosophical under um, uh, undercurrents of it, but this is something which you cannot from the, if you look at it from the point of view the, of the classical tradition, yeah, this is an argument that you cannot refute. If you look at it from the point of view of the, uh, the uh, Christian theological tradition, yeah, again it is something that you cannot refute at all because pain has been seen as something which will essentially edify human character. Yeah? So, even within the aspect of Christian uh, theology, it is not as if pain is seen as something terrible. Pain is seen as something which will eventually lead to uh, the betterment of the soul itself, yeah? which will lead to the betterment of uh, uh, a, 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 the individual characters as well as the community itself. Yeah? So, there are these multiple things coming together over here when he is situating pleasure as not the opposite of pain, but as something which, uh, uh, which you know, which, uh, which gives a long lasting impact yeah, on life in general. Yeah? He, uh, the production and assurance of pleasure in this highest sense is true utility. Those who produce and preserve this pleasure are poets or poetical philosophers. So, this is how this text also becomes a defense of poetry. Yeah, by trying to place imagination. So, this is you know in continuation, we can see this in continuation with the rhetoric that we found in uh, Sydney's apology for uh, Sydney's defense of poetry. Yeah. So, there he wanted to there, there was the need for, was more immediate to showcase that poets are actually not damaging the society, poets are actually not uh, promoting lies, yeah. they are not uh, promoting licentious behavior. Yeah. The need was very different then, but here the 
he is taking this to a more profound level by saying that the kind of pleasure which imagination affords, which is the end of imagination too, yeah, end as in the result, the result of imagination too, that is not something trivial. On the other hand, there is true utility in it and he is also using the term philosopher along with poetry. Poetry and philosophy were otherwise seen as two different things altogether, but from the time of even Coleridge, yeah, he is also a philosopher when he is writing criticism. Yeah. There is a philosophy at work which influenced him, European philosophy, Kant influenced him majorly in his all his compositions. So, these connections between literature and many other disciplines including philosophy, archaeology, yeah, they all become very uh, fluid at that time. Yeah. You cannot engage with literature as quote unquote pure literature, yeah, romantic from the romantic period onwards we begin to realize that there is nothing about preserving this purity at all. You need to go out of the you know these many boundaries including the national boundaries, including the political boundaries and including the boundaries of faith which is what his observation on Milton also highlights, yeah, where when uh, it is actually you know the paradise lost, yeah, pa paradise lost is a text that draws upon the Bible, yeah. But when you look at it in an aesthetic sense, Shelley says, yeah, Satan becomes a better moral being than God himself, yeah. That is the irony which uh, the romantic movement, the romantic critical framework also promotes and sustains quite efficiently in the years to come, yeah, in the many centuries to come, right, yeah. So, and then and, and this blurring of these genres and these discourses, they continue to dominate this text. The exertions of Locke, Hume, uh, Gibbon, Voltaire, Rousseau, although Rousseau has thus been classed, he was essentially a poet, the others even Voltaire were mere reasoners. Yeah? So, this is a note that Shelley had given, you know, which, which has been inserted into the text now. Yeah? This is a note that he has given to classify Rousseau also as a literary artist. Yeah? So, within the same person, we find there is a political revolutionary as well as a, a poet. Uh, who, who is at work. Yeah? Now, he moves on to what I think is the most cardinal point that he is trying to make in this entire piece of writing. Yet, it is easy to calculate the degree of moral and intellectual empowerment which the world would have exhibited had they never lived. He is talking about you know. Now, so far the defense had been about defending the presence of these, defending the writings of these uh, people who uh, uh, these uh, literary artists. Now, he is talking about the possibility of a world where these writings were not there at all. So, what would have been the result? A little more nonsense would have been talked for a century or two and perhaps a few more men, women and children burned as heretics. Yeah, very, very straightforward. Yeah, if these people were not there, if poetry were not there, yeah, if these sort of artistic uh, manifestations were not there, this is what you have. Yeah, if had this been a theocratic state, had this been a state ruled by, you know, a series of monarchs without paying attention to what is being culturally transmitted, what is being literally transmitted, then more of nonsense and more of, you know, burning at stake, uh, uh, burning uh, people as heretics. Yeah, and he draws this a very, very uh, a pointed attack over here, we might not at this moment have been congratulating, it, congratulating each other on the abolition of the inquisition in P Spain. This happened, the inquisition in Spain is something which went on like for more than a century, it is about, it was about you know, it was a, uh, uh, a very catholic kind of thing to uh, continue to burn people as heretics and the, it was a very legal thing to do as well. Yeah, So, that comes to an end I think in 1834 or something, that is during the time when England was uh, proclaiming itself as this uh, very progressive uh, modern democracy, which also we had begun to show its lenience upon its uh, see colonizers. They were trying to be very different compared to the other uh, rest of Europe. So, he is now capitalizing on that say that that uh, moral superiority on that political superiority that England has and tells them we would not be congratulating each other on this occasion when uh, inquisition is being abolished in Spain. Yeah, because what we would have perhaps become worse than Spain if we did not have these sort of you know things to aid us. So, Locke, Hume, Gibbon, Voltaire, Rousseau, yeah, poetry. So, defense of poetry becomes very, very pertinent over here. It becomes useful more than any other kinds of writings, more than religious writings, more than philosophical writings, more than philo political writings. Poetry becomes useful. Forget about the need to defend poetry, it becomes the most useful thing ever produced. And now, he is also uh, say, but it exceeds all imagination to conceive what would have been the 
moral condition of the world if these people will come to that. So, thus far, when Sidney was defending, uh, the, doing his apology uh, for poetry, at that time, his contention was to uh, the the. Uh, I hope you are able to see how the argument gets re reversed. Sidney wanted to prove to the world that see poets are not doing anything. He was very defensive in that sense. This is actually this is not a defensive sort of a defense. Yeah, Sidney had to protect the poets and say that see this uh, uh, evil, this uh, these vices were always there. We are not really, you know, the poets have not really claimed to say any truth. They have not claimed to do anything. So please do not accuse them of being liars either. Yeah. So here it's the other way around. Yeah. He is talking about the entire absence of this faculty of imagination and what would have happened to humanity if all of these people were wiped out of the earth. What would have been the moral condition of the world if neither Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Cauldron, Lord Bacon, um, Nor Milton had ever existed. You also find, you know, the uh, it's a very transnational kind of uh, defense that he builds up. He is not defending English poetry. He is defending the poets <coughs> who wrote about different things at different points of time and who need who never. Uh, who never had occupied the same ideological position at any given point of time. That is also the liberation that the critical movement, romantic critical movement opens up. Yeah, look at the other things he says. If Raphael and Michelangelo had never been born, if the Hebrew poetry had never been translated, if a revival of the study of Greek literature had never taken place, if no monuments of ancient sculpture had been handed down to us, and if the poetry of the religion of the ancient world had been extinguished together with its belief. Look at the things which are being brought together different ideological things, antiquity and modernity together, different different genres, different disciplines. He is defending the faculty of imagination over here if you notice. He is defending not particular works and particular authors, but about the quality of imagination which had made all of these things possible. The human mind could never except by the intervention of these excitements, these are positive words now over here. Uh, except by the intervention of these excitements have been awakened to the invention of the grosser sciences and that application of analytical reasoning to the aberrations of society which it is now attempted to exalt over the direct expression of the inventive and creative faculty itself. It is a very audacious way of defending poetry and by large by extension the faculty of imagination itself. Yeah, he is referring to the other things, the other useful things as gross sciences, the application of analytical reasoning to the aberrations of society. He talks about other sciences as different means through which many aberrations in the society are being justified, yeah, industrialization and later on we know that that is only the beginning we know and later on we know that most of the modern analytical tools are also about justifying certain evils in the society which of course you know the society also like it is a very vicious kind of relationship which uh, from which the society also uh, gains a lot from. We will uh, not go into the details of this. So, this is the kind of rhetoric that becomes possible from this uh, uh, period onwards. Yeah. So, we will wrap up with this uh, as of now. Yeah. So, if you could uh, continue reading on this and the final section is on the divine quality of poetry and as you can we can already double guess it he is not really talking about divine in the sense that we have understood divine so far he uh, will be talking about the divine quality of poetry in order to show that how poetry forget about you know uh, being an immoral influence on the society that is the only thing which can save the society yeah and this rhetoric also continues as we can see even during the uh, Victorian period when faith crumbles when the uh, you know when uh, this uh, dichotomy between faith and science happens over there and suddenly there is this realization you know what were we eventually fighting about what were we es essentially thinking about when we were relying our hope on faith or on science and poetry at that time we find that it is being presented as this human emotions in general are being presented as the panacea for all of these evils which were otherwise seen as very very utilitarian compared to uh, poetry right. So, we will uh, wrap up with this today. Please continue reading and uh, I think we should be able to complete this text by tomorrow with a discussion on the general romantic uh, trends and then we will move on to the Victorian uh, thing as well. Mm -hmm.